I've written that that in about 2014, the world went from a post-war era to a pre-war era. That is, in a in a post-war era, international life revolves around the questions and problems that were left over from the last great international conflict. It's a kind of a mopping up stabilization. In a pre-war era, international life is dominated by problems that if you don't solve them could lead to the next great power conflict. So we're clearly in a pre-war era in that sense, but how long will it last? What is China's timetable? Um, it's hard for me to see China invading Taiwan before the next election on the island in 2024. Because if the KMT wins, then the Chinese might have a reasonable hope of gaining the prize at some point without all the uh, the cost and risk of, of a war. So, you know, you have, I think that's a real factor. Um, and then depending on what happens in on Taiwan and how the new Taiwanese government conducts itself, we would see something else. Um, I think right now the Chinese probably feel that their own economy is not as stable as they would like it to be. And so that um, a, a war which would, you know, would be economically devastating for China, a war over Taiwan would be economically de devastating to all of us. But for China, you know, there'll be no ships, shipments of oil and, and soybeans and things through, you know, into China, uh, even if the U.S. didn't blockade, and I believe we would blockade, um, insurers are not going to insure shipping in a war zone. Um, you know, so, and there'll be no exports from, from China. What does that do to employment in China? Uh, I would certainly see the U.S. freezing all Chinese sovereign assets including their very large holdings of U.S. Treasury bills, so that their, you know, the the sort of international currency stock would be worthless overnight. Um, so, you know, this is this is not something that China is is lightly going to undertake. They might do it, but there are heavy costs, and they know there are heavy costs. And the long-term risks are great. China is not self-sufficient in energy. It's not self-sufficient in food. Um, war is, is a very, very serious proposition. So I believe that, that if we act deliberately and intelligently, Japanese are doubling their defense budget. Australia has its new defense review. I think contains some very, very positive things. In the U.S., our budgets are going up and we're thinking in a much more focused way. India, I believe, is beginning to think about the South China Sea more than it has in the past. Vietnam knows what's at stake. So um, I think it's still possible that we get through this without a confrontation with China. It's not, unfortunately, certain that we can get out. And to some degree, it's out of our hands. It's China will make these decisions. So I don't, I don't hold with putting a timetable on what they do. I would say we are in the gray zone. I hope we can stay out of the red zone. It will require though, won't it, as you've written yourself, I think, uh, America to be coherent about the whole thing. And you, I think you've written about how Many countries are now seeing that they need to stand with America. You've just referred to some of them as America Plus. So they're seeing the need to add strength and capability to America. But some are developing Plan B in case America does decide to withdraw or does divide so badly that it looks incoherent. And Plan B is how do we make peace with China? And that brings to mind my, to my way of thinking the, what Churchill warned about, those who feed the crocodiles. Uh, thinking they won't be eaten, simply get eaten last. It's a dangerous right, strategy. Dan. Yeah, I, I think that's happening. Uh, 